you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to this wonderful meeting. I have to admit it's my first time here. Uh, I usually go to uh, our society, International Society for Computational Biology, our uh, flagship conferences such as ICM and ECCB, but it is wonderful. I see that it's very similarly organized and I met uh, many, many interesting people here already. Okay, so um, today I will give an overview of some of the things that we have been doing in my lab over the past um, 12, 13 years or so. And uh, uh, the talk will be organized as follows. So basically, we view biology and medicine as a complex world of interconnected entities. So I will first do some introduction, uh, talk a little bit about the data and the challenges, computational challenges uh, of the analytics of those data. And then I will introduce some examples of new methods, because clearly in uh, 35 or whatever, 40 minutes I cannot do everything. And I will focus on the following. First, how do we analyze a single layer of molecular data? Um, and then how do we uh, integrate the information obtained from multiple levels of molecular data? And if there is any time, uh, in the end I'll point to some future directions. So let's slowly start. Um, we all know that um, large biomedical or omics data have uh, started appearing at ever-increasing rates from genomes and epigenomes to transcriptomes, proteomes, met met metabolomes, phenomes, metagenomes, and so forth. And they're deposited in uh, many, many publicly available databases. All of these data describe different aspects of the same system. So they are basically like a different lens through which we look into the same phenomenon, which is usually a a living cell, and uh, we try to infer something from it about uh, human health. So each of these, whether it's transcriptional regulation or protein structure, protein-protein interactions, uh, genetic interactions, epistatic interactions, metabolic reactions, all of them are just different views of the same thing. And this is why we have to extract as much as as much information as possible from each of them individually, but then in the end we must fuse them all together to get a full picture of the phenomenon and study. As I mentioned, um, they, uh, these data are deposited in many databases, uh, including patient uh, uh, health records. There are various ontologies that try to organize our uh, biomedical data. Um, uh, also, that there are many, there's a lot of information on drugs and so forth. And uh, currently, we are actually at a very nice moment in the history of bioinformatics where uh, technological advances have yielded very large amounts of data, but without computer science and mathematics, we cannot really advance too much. So basically, uh, uh, there are many interesting and important problems that computational scientists need to address to move this uh, field forward. And this has uh, been a booming research area, as you know. Why do we need mathematics or computing at all? Um, and why, in the view of these large hairballs or, or these interconnected systems of whatever kind they are? Well, uh, while uh, we have had the genomes of various species for a long time, most of the problems dealing with analysis of sequences fall into the so-called category of computationally easy problems, meaning that in the polynomial time of the size of the input, you can solve them exactly. Unfortunately, many questions that we ask about large networks fall into the so-called uh, category of computationally intractable problems, NP-hard, NP-complete, uh, which means that you cannot exactly solve them even given all the time of the universe and all the compute power of the universe. So the only way to address them is to approximately solve them. And these approximate ways are so-called heuristics, approximate algorithms or heuristic algorithms by which we try to address them. So one uh, simple example is comparison, just simple comparison of large networks. That problem is computationally intractable. Stephen Cook has proven that mathematically in 1971, which means that you cannot exactly compare or align large networks uh, exactly. So we have to do that uh, approximately. And I will uh, uh, mention some of the methods uh, for, for doing that. So extracting information from each of these layers is computationally intractable. So we do it approximately. But even greater challenge is how do we integrate them to see what they collectively tell us? 
So this is what uh, we will be talking about today. And of course, a grand challenge, especially for this conference, is how do we do that in a patient-centric way? Okay, so that to improve, to personalize treatment, to improve uh, uh, um, health outcomes and so forth. Okay, so now let's talk about the single layer. And um, I will probably go a little bit fast to try to cover most of the data, but I think these are being recorded so you can uh, go back. As I understand, these are educational, supposed to be educational sessions. Okay, so let's talk first about molecular networks before we uh, talk about patient-centered data integration. Uh, we know that uh, there are many different types. Um, one of those types of, mole of molecular networks that we've uh, uh, analyzed heavily is so-called protein-protein interaction networks, where basically uh, each protein we model as a node, and if physical interaction is possible, then we put an edge in between. Okay, now, given two such networks, how do we compare them? As I said, there is no exact way of to do that, so we can we have to uh, uh, do something approximate, meaning maybe we count the number of nodes in one and the other and compare that, the number of edges in one and the other and compare that. Then the degree of a node is in the number of links that it has, the number of edges that touch the node. So maybe we do the distribution of all the links in the network and compare those. But all of these are very simple and very primitive heuristics that fail. I mean, every heuristic is guaranteed to fail on certain examples. There is no way around it. I mean, this is what computational intractability actually means. So I will show you here a very simple example of network G and network H that are of the same size, so they have the same number of nodes, the same number of edges. Each node in each network has the same degree, degree 2, and you can eyeball them and see that they're very different. One is connected, one is disconnected, and so forth. So we have to do something smarter. And quite a while ago now, actually 13 years ago, I introduced so-called graphlets uh, in this paper in bioinformatics um, as basically building blocks like Legos of large networks. So what are graphlets? This is a, a technical definition that I only put because it's an educational session. They are induced subgraphs of large networks. What does induced mean? Let's see that let's say that our entire network is this triangle here, and let's pick all three nodes. So a partial subgraph notion will tell you that there is this three-node path, the red one, then there is this three-node path, the second one, and then there is a third three-node path amongst the, these three nodes. But if you'd like to understand the structure of any family of graphs, you care about all possible connections between, between the nodes. So basically, if you pick all possible connections, you see that this is actually a triangle. This is not three three-node paths. It's a triangle. So this is what induced means, okay? So these are graphlets, induced subgraphs of large networks, and they're of any frequency. So they're unlike motifs. Network motifs are partial, like those three node paths, and they have to be overrepresented in your data compared to some, to some random graph model, and there are many different random graph models, and if you pick a wrong model, not well-fitting model, then you'll have different motifs and so forth. So, so the notion of network motifs is a bit problematic. It's been problematic ever since it was introduced, and this is why a couple of years after that was introduced, I introduced graphlets to, to remedy that problem. And since then, I've done many things, and others have also, uh, using these graphlets. So basically, what we're asking here is how are these little Lego blocks of large networks organized, and whether we can figure out from the way they're built, from the way they're organized, whether in the end we have you know, a pumpkin or an airplane. How do they fit together, actually? And we designed uh, very sophisticated models uh, of, or actually methods um, of uh, measuring how they fit together. And the simple one is an analogy to the degree of, of the node, which is the number of edges that the node touches. You see this node, red node touches four edges. Then we count how many of each of these guys the node touches, but at a particular symmetry group, at a particular location. So for example, how many three node paths it touches at an end, how many three node paths it touches in the middle, and so forth, and you do these counts, how many triangles it touches, and so forth, okay? And so rather than just the degree of a node, then we will have a vector of counts of the neighborhood, of the structures around a node in the network. For this, let's say, node A, we have these numbers, and then for all other nodes, you also has, have this vector of numbers counting how many little structures it has around. 
And then what do we do in one of the uh, early works? Basically, we now go along the columns, and this is your degree distribution. And then this is the distribution of, of degree one, graph of degree one, graph of degree two, and so forth. So now you have many numbers, many, many distributions describing the structure of your network. And then once you're presented with another network, you get their distributions uh, of the other network, you compare them, and then you see how similar two networks are. And we wanted to have many of these numbers so that to try to restrict the, the uh, in how many ways the networks can vary to be more sure that these networks are structurally similar. But still, I didn't tell you how they fit together. Here, between graphlets, you can see that there are redundancies and dependencies. Redundancies, uh, I, will, I will talk about, and then dependencies later. So first, we have to eliminate all of the redundancies. Okay? And this is very, very simple mathematics. So let's say that C0 is the degree of a node, the number of neighbors of a node. Okay? So C, uh, let, let's say that C2 is the degree of this orbit 2, okay, so how many of three node paths and node touches in the middle, and C3, how many triangles and node touches. So, and then we reason as follows. For the neighbors of node A are either connected or not, okay? If they are not connected, then they contribute to these counts of C2, the middle of a three node path, okay, if B, C are not connected, okay? If they are connected, then they contribute to the number of triangles, okay, and actually this orbit C, C, C2. Okay? Which means that the number of possible uh, combinations, C0 choose 2, equals C2 plus C3. Very simple. And then we do that for all uh, of the up to five node graphlets. We have 17 equations, meaning we can eliminate 17 of these graphlets, which we do. And the, the, the way we do that, that the choice of these uh, uh, orbits that we eliminate does not matter. But then we still have dependencies. For example, this orbit 21 in it contains orbit 0 along these ways, orbit 5 along these ways, orbit 1, if you go that way, orbit 2 all of these ways, and orbit 7 here, the middle of here, right? Okay, and somebody would say, oh, this is terrible. You have dependencies, this is disaster, especially in the machine learning community. No, this is perfect, this is excellent. Because different data sets will have different dependencies, and this is exactly what we want to exploit, the structure of the data. So again, we have for each node those vectors that we showed you of, of numbers, of integers, and then again, we go along the columns, but here we do Spearman's correlations between them, so we have numbers between 0 and 1, and then we come up with this so-called GCM, Graphlet Correlation Matrix, which is 11 by 11 compression uh, of the actual structure of your data, of your network. So network of any size, of any density, you compress in this 11 by 11 GCM. And we can talk later why 11 by 11. It all has its, its purpose. And then, given two networks, you compute easily these two GCMs, and then you compare the, the, these matrices, GCMs of the networks, and then you have the network distance. And this is uh, thus far the best performing uh, measure to, to cluster the networks, the measure of distance that clusters the networks, both synthetic data and real data. We'll focus on real data here. Uh, this is just a three-dimensional embedding of various real-world networks that is based on this distance that I just showed you how we compute. And for example, we can see that all metabolic networks cluster together, uh, then all protein structure networks are here, uh, Facebook networks are here, this is Facebook networks of, of 100 American universities, these are computer networks of the internet, uh, these are world trade networks over different years, and so forth. Okay, and we will not go into, into more detail, and then just to show you that what you can do then, then you can have a linear combination of these counts of orbits, so a zero times orbit of uh, the count of this orbit, a plus a one times the count of this orbit, and so forth. And you can have a linear combination of whatever uh, descriptors you want. Uh, this particular example is from economics, but we did the same uh, for protein interaction network and, and uh, gene ontology of, of genes. And then you do so-called canonical correlation analysis, which is a standard uh, statistical technique to maximize that correlation. 
And then you can say that, okay, well, this orbit here, if this is a mediator between a dense neighborhood and, and uh, also a, a periphery, then it's, a, for example, in, in here is an indicator of economic prosperity of a country. So it's not enough that the country is densely linked. If it does not have peripherals with which it trades, it will be in debt. So that's just in economics. But as I mentioned, uh, this is go terms. Uh, and these different orbits, and in this example, we see that membrane proteins uh, are tend to be these hubby ones, while transcription factors are in densely linked neighborhood. And there is more to that, but in the interest of time, I'd like to, to skip details. Okay, so what we have found over the years is that this similarity in the wiring patterns around the node, so basically these vectors around the nodes that describe the topology around the nodes, the number of triangles, the number of squares, and so forth. They're uh, closely linked, or actually, if you make clusters of these uh, proteins in the protein interaction network that have similar wiring patterns, uh, those clusters are significantly enriched uh, with the same biological function, membership in the same protein complexes, the same, same subcellular localization, tissue co-expression in human, and involvement in disease. And you can see that this doesn't only work for, for uh, um, uh, proteins that are connected. Uh, there are also proteins in the other part of the network that are far away from, from these proteins, but because they are in a similar neighborhood, you can see that this part of the network looks like a mirror image of the other. They have similarity in, in biological function and processes. And we actually use this to only by using the network structure or protein interaction network of human find new members of melanin production pathways. We've also shown that the same cancer, the proteins in the same cancer type are more similarly wired. And in this way, we can identify proteins that are uh, in the same uh, cancer pathway, cancer related pathway, but that are far away, that they're not direct neighbors of the known proteins. And these, uh, uh, our predictions were phenotypically validated. Uh, in Professor Anand Ganesan's lab uh, at UC Irvine, where I studied, started my tenure track in 2005. Okay, so, uh, and he validated that using uh, siRNA screens. Um, another application, as I said, is network alignment. This is analogous to sequence alignment. We've seen that sequence alignments, we've had those methods for some time now, and they were, they've revolutionized our understanding of disease, of uh, uh, evolution, and so forth. And an expectation is that network alignment will have similar groundbreaking impacts. And starting from uh, early methods such as Isorang from Bonnie Berger's lab at MIT mathematics department uh, that was inspired by Google's PageRank, um, uh, these methods have evolved and improved. In my lab, we have had so-called GRAL methods for graph aligner, and the latest one, so-called LGRAL, this is pairwise alignment of two networks. This is uh, uh, LGRAS alignment of yeast and human protein-protein interaction networks. And you can see that almost the entire uh, yeast protein interaction network is aligned to some human proteins at, where the topology is preserved. And you can see basically this large network of 5,700 nodes and over 16,000 interactions simultaneously exist in yeast and human. And this is the first indication that actually huge regions, not just small pathways or protein complexes and so forth, huge regions of structure of protein interaction networks are conserved between species even as diverse as yeast and human. And these are some references, and I will come back to this in the end. Just to mention that all you see is generalized to directed networks. So you can analyze, for example, metabolic networks if you'd like. And you can also track network dynamics. But in the, in the interest of time, I will skip that. We published uh, in July last year, my, my postdoc and I, one perspective uh, on, on basically these methods and where we see the future will go. And also these methods have been used in many applications. For example, with Charlie Boone's lab at the University of Toronto, uh, we were on that paper analyzing their uh, uh, global genetic interaction map of Baker's yeast. Um, my PhD is from University of Toronto, so I have very strong links there. But not only in biology and medicine are these methods used. They are used in, in very diverse uh, um, um, uh, applications such as uh, image categories recognition, scene classification, photo cropping, personality and affective states recognition in companies to maximize uh, a productivity and so forth. So they've gathered quite some number of references. And since I only have uh, 15 minutes left, 
Now I will tell you how we use all this that we have done for um, getting as much information as we have uh, as we can from one type of data, whether it's a protein attraction network or metabolic network or transcription regulation and whatnot. How do we uh, uh, fuse all of these data together in a unified way to improve uh, precision medicine, disease reclassification, to learn more about gene ontology, and in the end, uh, about network alignment. Okay, so over here I'll talk only about uh, uh, cancer, but we uh, have work in, in, in other domains, but there is no time for that. So uh, let's slowly start. I will start from uh, simpler examples towards more complicated, but it is all the same unifying framework. So if you understand this one, you will understand them all. They all work on the same principles, even though to, to design a mo model and to implement a model that solves you, the, your particular data, you need quite some work. Again, because all of these are NP-hard problems for which you need to design individual solutions. So all of them are intractable. Okay, so in our paper from PSB, Pacific Symposium on Biocomputing in 2016, we took uh, the data from uh, TCGA, 353, uh, 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 for 353 patients of serous ovarian cancer. Um, and uh, uh, in addition to that, we took the, so basically we have for each patient, we have their somatic, muta uh, somatic mutation profile. So from patient, you can see this link towards the genes, yeah, the, the mutated genes. Then on genes, we took the data from Biogrid and from Keg on protein-protein interactions, genetic epistatic interactions, and metabolic interactions. Um, then uh, we went to Drug Bank and took the entire database. We have drug target interactions, as Drug Bank tells us, and we also have drug chemical similarity network. Using SMILES, we're computing chemical similarities, and that's another network. So within the same framework, we want to do three tasks. We want to uh, better stratify these patients. We want to predict new driver genes, and we want to repurpose already known drugs. Um, okay, so what we want to do here is we want to co-cluster patients, genes, and drugs. And even clustering is an NP-hard problem. This is why you have many different clustering methods, whether it's hierarchical clustering, k-means, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, but now you have co-clustering of heterogeneous data. So even for homogeneous data, it's hard, but now it's even harder for heterogeneous data. So how do we do that? We, we were inspired by so-called non-negative matrix factorization, where you have this data of n entries. You approximate this matrix of your data with two factors, f and g, where basically, and this is a relaxed form of k-means. This has been uh, uh, shown in 99 in Nature, where basically this uh, um, f matrix contains cluster centroids and gene is a cluster membership indicator. So which entries, which data points belong to which cluster and K is the number of clusters. Okay, so this uh, technique has been known for uh, a number of years, not quite 20, but let's say 18. But this is homogeneous data, but we have heterogeneous data. And this is why I have to do so-called three-factorization. So let's say here, uh, somatic mutation profiles, this matrix R1, 2, we want to uh, approximate it with three matrices, G1 times H1, 2 times G2. This is because in this one we'll have cluster of patients, in this one we'll have cluster of genes, and this will be a compressed representation of this matrix that will provide the links between these clusters of patients with the genes, okay? Uh, we want it to be penalized to include the topologies from all of these layers of data simultaneously from molecular networks and, and a drug chemical similarity. And of course we want it to be uh, non-negative so that we have cluster interpretation. And now this matrix R23 of drugs to drug targets to their, their binding uh, uh, proteins, we again uh, approximated with three matrices. Now put it both together, we have these factorizations, but then we share this factor. So, and this sharing of the factor in, in basically ensures fusion of all these data. Okay? So this is just a rewrite of that. <coughs> Excuse me. So we are sharing this matrix G2. Now, how do we approximate the first matrix with three factors and the second one? Well, this is a minimization problem. I apologize, I'll have to take some water. <clears throat> so basically, you have this difference uh, between R12 and the product of these three factors, R23 and the product. So you want, you want to optimize this, you want to minimize this uh, distance between them. 
and this is your penalties that come from molecular interaction networks and from drug uh, 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 chemical similarity. And let's not go into more details. It, this is just a standard uh, uh, thing that we use in machine learning all the time, how to minimize J. We can randomly initialize uh, matrices and then we, we can follow some update rules and these are the update rules that you always have to uh, 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 derive specifically for each problem that you study individually because this optimization is again an MP-hard continuous optimization problem and this is why there is no exact solution. And then, you know, you, you get start from random or there are some other uh, ways to do it and then you update one matrix, second, third and so forth and then you stop when there is no difference between, between iterations. So you iterate until there is no difference. Standard, standard technique. And now from this equation that I showed you, at the same time we have clusters of patients, so patient stratification will come from here, then we will have drug repurposing from this uh, basically R23 matrix, um, and then uh, we will have a driver gene prediction basically from clusters of genes obtained by fusion of all these data that are already enriched with driver genes. And why is this? Well, because uh, as we all know, cancer is very heterogeneous and different patients of the same cancer will have different mutations, but they usually lie on the same pathways or similar pathways, or same function pathways. Okay, so just a highlight of the results. For example, in terms of patient stratification, we see three clusters, uh, significantly different uh, Kaplan-Meier survivor curves, three patient groups uh, uh, of significant size, 131 patients, 53 patients, 169 patients. The second number is how many uh, unfortunately died already. Um, then in terms of driver gene prediction, 40% of our predictions, of 40% of these, we had 809 uh, predictions. We validated in the databases that we intentionally did not use in the fusion, in our data fusion, so that we could use them for validation. But of course, if you were to do this really, you would use all the available data. Um, and then in terms of drug repurposing, uh, uh, this is to illustrate, this is uh, to illustrate the power of data fusion. This is so-called five-fold cross-validation, meaning we exclude the fifth of the data and run our model, run our method on the rest of the data, and how well do we predict the fifth of the data that we know, and we exclude it. And if you only use drug target interactions to predict them, this is how accurate you are, but as soon as you add metabolic networks, dramatic, dramatically improve the performance, and with the addition of more data, you are more and more accurate. All right, and uh, for, for drug repurposing also, the 37% 30, of our predictions we validated in the databases that we didn't use uh, to, to uh, make the predictions. And this is just ongoing work where you can basically do drug repurposing. Uh, we have some patients from collaborators at Imperial College where, where I worked for seven years uh, before I moved to University College London. And this is just to illustrate the beauty of this method, not just the power, but the beauty. So these are patients uh, and these are the therapies that these actual patients receive, the, the thick lines. These are their uh, mutation profiles to particular genes. These are drug target interactions. Uh, there are metabolic interactions uh, between gene genetic, epistatic interactions, and protein-protein interactions. Each of these matrices we are decomposing, but we share matrix factors G1 across these two, G3 across these two, and G2 across here. And then when you do drug repurposing prediction that this particular drug should be given to this particular patient, then you would know why, through which, muta which mutation, you know, uh, the, the patient has and why you should repurpose that drug. And this all comes at the same cost from the same computational framework. Now, I'm, let me just mention in the interest of time other things that we have done using this same methodology, as I said, uh, disease reclassification. So we all know that diseases have been classified about a century ago based on the symptoms and more, more, the most affected organs. Uh, so basically, this is how doctors learn what are the relationships. For example, I mean, if you have diabetes, you are more likely to develop certain types of cardiovascular disease, but you're less like diabetes actually protects you from some other types of cardiovascular disease. But 100 years ago, we didn't have any information about molecular data. So the question is, how much of disease uh, classification, classification still holds in the light of novel, new, modern molecular level data? 
And we tried to address that question three years ago, four years ago now. Now within the same framework, we have genes, we have drugs, we have drug-target interactions, drug uh, similarity, chemical similarity. We have all sorts of genetic interactions, cell signaling, metabolic interaction, course pressure. Pruning. You can put any data you have in here. Uh, then we have disease ontology and which genes, uh, um, which diseases are caused by which genes, and we have uh, gene annotations and ontology here, gene ontology and disease ontology. And we get all, the, the, all those data publicly available, and now we have these block matrices that we basically integrate in the same framework as before. So let's not go through that. It's the same thing, but again, you have different update rules. I mean, it's, it's very computationally intractable. There is a lot of uh, uh, science, but also art in how you analyze these data. And just some of the results, we found 14 disease-disease associations that are currently not present in disease ontology, but for which we found evidence uh, uh, through comorbidity data and literature curation, genetic interactions, epithetic interactions with the most important predictor of a link between diseases, despite that data set being the smallest, and others have noticed that before and in different applications, and omission of any data sites reduces the quality of our predictions. And interestingly, 80% of disease ontology holds in the light of modern molecular level data, but 20% still may be open for modif modifications. Similarly, we were inspired by the paper uh, uh, from Trey Idaka's lab from 2013, where they uh, posed the question, uh, the similar question about gene ontology. Gene ontology, we know some of it is experimental, but a lot of it is derived from sequence alignment. So how about that we, we see whether we can do these predictions from networks, and how do we do it the best uh, 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 by integrating all available molecular network data. Again, similar problem. Uh, we minimize this function R12, which are annotations from, from uh, Go terms to, to genes. Uh, decompose three matrices, but then we have these uh, uh, penalties that come from each of these individual layers. One penalty comes from direct interactions, direct proximity, direct neighborhoods of particular genes or proteins in these networks. And this the term is their graphlet similarity, you know, the, 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 the graphlets that I introduced and the analysis uh, and the tools that we introduced uh, uh, in the part, first part of the talk about analyzing single layer, okay? And, uh, of course, we outperform uh, uh, trade decrees and other methods. Um, in terms of network alignment, now I'm getting, getting back to network alignment. So we want to align proteins, let's say, of one network onto proteins of another protein, protein interaction network, whether it's of a diseased cell to a healthy one or over different species. And there are many methods, because this is, this is uh, uh, NP-hard, this is computationally intractable. All methods, of course, are heuristic, they must be. Uh, and there's no gold standard. And in our most recent paper that we just published uh, one or two months ago, we asked uh, which aligner is good for which data, which scoring scheme to use for evaluation, because there are many, what's the coverage, biological, which biological regions do you align by different aligners, which topological ones you align, and what's the contribution of topology versus sequence, okay? Um, and we evaluated uh, the state-of-the-art, all state-of-the-art aligners on the largest protein interaction data sets that, that uh, there are. We had many aligners. Uh, we tested the, all of the major uh, scoring schemes, and then we did Pearson correlations between them, and then basically we found out that CAG pathways, so basically all of the biological uh, uh, scoring schemes clustered together, all of the topological ones clustered together, but uh, CAG... Uh, has the highest correlations across them all, and uh, this S3 has, uh, in terms of topology. Now, interestingly, um, all aligners map biologically and topologically different regions of networks. So each of them would cover only up to, at most, 50% of the proteins of the larger network. But then we took them together in a new tool called Uline, uh, so this is a union of the best network aligners, and it produces the best, the most biologically co coherent aligners. Interestingly, the most topologically co coherent alignments come from using only topology, and the most biologically coherent aligners come from using sequence only to align these data, and we asked why. 
um, are existing annotations ill-suited or are there methodological limitations? And we found out that actually there are methodological limitations because these are pairwise aligners. They all have different scoring functions, different ways to explore the networks. Uh, and I will show you how to combine topology and sequence information, both of them, to get the most out of it. And we did this uh, in a new aligner called Fuse. This is for multiple network alignment, which is, of course, even more complicated than pairwise network alignment. We align protein interaction networks of uh, uh, human, yeast, C. elegans, mouse, and fly by using this matrix three factorization approach that I told you, using these block matrices. So it's the same technique where, I mean, this is just uh, out of here. This is just example where G1 is shared, but it's the same across, you know, from, from each data set to others. And then this is, again, very hard. There are other heuristics, uh, k-partite matching you need to solve and so forth, but let's not get into the details. Just to show you, so the solid line is, uh, um, uh, our, our method fuse, uh, and this is biological process from Go, and we beat uh, uh, sequence alignment. So basically, if you only use sequence alignment to align proteins between these species, then you are this much accurate. But if you include topology in a, our method called fuse, our alignment called fuse, then you go up. And the same is for molecular function and others. This is just an illustration of the results. And of course, uh, also, um, this is um, the number of clusters uh, across aligned networks, and this is when all five species, the proteins of all five species are aligned, and this is just two species, three species, four species, we see that our method has the largest number of clusters that cover all species, and this is the number of proteins that, uh, in the clusters covering all species, and we beat all other methods. Similarly, in terms of Go, biological process, and molecular function, uh, we see that our method beats all others by, by a large margin. Okay, so I only have about a minute left, so I will not perhaps talk about future directions. I will uh, skip that part. Let me just go through this. Uh, just to mention that uh, to advance, uh, I believe it's time to have paradigm shifts, both methodological and conceptual. Conceptually, I don't think we should be thinking of one data set only in isolation. We have to fuse it with other data set in an integrated way. We should be talking about integrated cells and not, I don't know, sequence alignment, but, but uh, uh, alignment of integrated cells of all data. But then, of course, that leads to uh, uh, leaps that we need to achieve in methodologies for aligning, because these are computationally intractable problems. Uh, that will capture multi-scale organization of the data and so forth. So if you'd like to read more about those perspectives, that's uh, in our science paper from less than a year ago. In the end, for funding, I'd like to thank the ERC, uh, European Research Council, uh, for the starting grant that I uh, hold right now, NSF, while I was uh, in the US uh, at UC Irvine. I held an NSF equivalent career grant and also afterwards a two million grant with a couple of colleagues and some other uh, uh, organizations that have been funding uh, my work, and of course, my lab members, uh, without whom none of this would have been possible. I'm looking for postdocs, PhD students. If you're interested, let me know. And thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to take some questions. Thank you.